This program is coming to you via Relay 2 satellite, a spacecraft orbiting the Earth at a speed of over 17,000 miles per hour. Exertus. Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. Join us on another exciting adventure of Exertus. Present to everybody. There you go. Well, go ahead. Right. Good evening, everybody. Good. <laughs> Welcome to uh, what would you a sneak peek? I don't know. I mean, I was gonna probably record this pretty soon, but it takes a lot of time to record stuff. So I figured I'd show you what I was working on. I've got this all pretty halfway done right now, um, but it's all about how Lucifer is light, and so light comes from the breath of God that moved upon the waters. And really, in the beginning, there was only God, and therefore, God is darkness. I mean, it's not necessarily that God is the color dark but like the darkness that it comes from and also that it commands all the sounds. And so that came up in a number of ways this week. One of the main ones is that I'm surrounded by mosquitoes and I don't really like have a huge problem with mosquitoes. They don't really bite me that much, but uh, a lot of people I know do uh, and their, their blood, is, you know, they might have the promoter sequences. I think there's like three or four that actually make one taste better to mosquitoes and lure them over to them, especially people who come from families who've ever had malaria, which is a whole other thing. But I didn't really want to kill the mosquitoes. You know, I mean, I've, I've been just seeing all these window covered bugs, you know, I'm always hitting mis like bugs on the highway. I was like, there's gotta be yeah. a better way. But so, that, just, that just happens at about 50 kilometers an hour and they just start dying on your windscreen. Oh yeah, and if you go three times that, you get three times as many bugs anyway. So. <laughs> 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 karma so i found this thing that works called the mosquito ringtone and i actually have been using like different recordings of frequencies that do the same thing but these sonic frequencies strike terror in the hearts of insects uh and i like that it's my jam right there you know something that it like uses the sounds that uh you know are so unusual well it turns out that they you know when you listen to it you're like okay it sounds a lot like bats and thinking about it, that makes a lot of sense, you know. So it's actually emulating the form of the master of, you know, serpents, but also what is that, you know, at the end of the day? Because a fruit bat likes fruit and a vampire bat, you know, is it really a vampire? Like, I like bats, you know. I mean, bats seem friendly and they eat bugs. I mean, I've always liked bats, even as a kid, you know. And, you know, in the eternal words of Peter Tosh, and I'm not quite paraphrasing, Vampires ain't bats. Tis mosquitoes said, you know, like in the vampire bits, man. Vampires, you know, like vampires. so. It's interesting that the Scottish accent's the Jamaican accent, but that's that's for another day. So, Stepping Razor Red X, an important documentary, has this quote: "Vampires don't come out and bite your neck anymore. Instead, they cause something destructive to happen. Blood will spill, and those invisible vampires will get their meals." Well, I don't fight against vampires. Vampires fight against I. I only protect myself from vampires. And, you know, because I know they exist and specifically visibly, we do not have to say who all the vampires know themselves and seen, or all they know that they're seen, and all the righteous ones know themselves being seen. So my thought is fruit bats eat fruit and vampire bats eat vampires. And I know that vampire bats, like right now, they like kill cattle sometimes, you know, like they, because they, they don't have the natural predators that they used to have in in the lands that used to be covered in you know guinea pigs and you know these uh, other animals you know what were they well i'll get back to that in a second actually like in the old world there were bigger things there were giant mosquitoes actually there even are to this day you know some rather large bats um and some i mean some larger insects like some mosquitoes that are bigger than your hands you know that are pretty pretty scary but uh, what do vampire bats do? They produce this saliva, and the protein inside the saliva is a protein called draculin that causes the blood 
to stop from clotting. So it's really useful actually in fighting against malaria. It's like the weirdest thing, like vampire bats bite saliva will help you avoid getting malaria. So, I mean, if you get bit by a mosquito, get the spit from a vampire bat. Um, and yeah, they now make this new chemical from it called draculin, which is, you know, from the glycoprotein of the amino acids. It's composed of 411 of them. And together it makes this anticoagulant that they've been using in all kinds of therapies for people with lymphoma, with strokes, with, uh, you know, people getting heart, uh, surgeries or brain surgeries, it'll, it's effective for up to nine hours and helps, you know, better than any blood thinner than we've ever invented. You know, I mean, this is just crazy science stuff. Um, so, you know, in a world filled with bugs and I'm seeing bigger and bigger bugs all the time. Um, also you have to think about how weird it is, uh, to be, a hem uh, to use hematophagy, which is like the, the eating of blood as your main way of uh, survival of sustenance there's not a lot of species that do that for obvious reasons they're just it takes a lot you know and uh you know but these mosquitoes do it so all of a sudden you've got this like a case for actual vampires that vampire bats consume and therefore vampire bats are you know the enemy of the enemy so they're pretty much my comrade right and i don't like mosquitoes right and just in general i don't like i don't like the idea of malaria because malaria even though i don't get too many bites from mosquitoes luckily i'm still scared of malaria like malaria has killed possibly half of all humans who ever lived like even talking about plagues apocalypses wars more you know people died from malaria than just about anything that's ever happened and you know like that's 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 why this like sound the sonic sound came up in my mind um as like it's an interesting echoing of both the darkness the the light the voice that moves upon the water that creates the light and it's effect of playing another instrument it basically plays a completely different um animal like a beast as its own you know so i like that plus there are there are uh, certain ones i think you can do that even work yeah that work against rats so you know your works. new favorite drink now right no what is it gin and tonic <laughs> tonic tonic is ruined i should have put that in there all right i'll put that in the real video because you know tonic now is just lots of chemicals and syrups and everything else like that yes but, but true tonic right um what's the stuff in tonic it's a uh, quinine 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 yeah quinine so quinine is uh is is amazing i mean that's that's probably worth looking into let me see if i can find some quinine i'd rather use beast Quinine is a medication used to treat malaria and barbius bar barbes bar babes babesiosis. Bab babesiosis. Have you seen this? I don't know what this is. No, never heard of it. It appeared out of nowhere. It yeah, babesiosis. It looks like it came out of the Lyme disease or something, right? It's a Lyme's disease trick. Oh gosh, Lyme. All right, so ticks bother me. I don't like ticks really. I don't. I don't like politics. Yeah, right. Like several, several nasty ticks. You know. Yeah. Well, I think it's starting to sound like a lot of these things are related in a sense. Like we forget how many species have um, communities in our bodies and are in co contact with their other communities and other bodies. So you could almost think about diseases as refugee populations or immigrant populations um, in the bo political body or, or the human body, like being similar. Like there's there's a certain amount of um, consciousness that exists. It's not the tick itself or the mouse itself or the human itself. It's any number of these other things that we're looking at. Like, sorry, let me close that. But the kinites, the zygotes, um, sporozoites, gametocytes like these kinds of things earth erythrocytes like they, they all live on multiple layers of the of the ecosystem you can almost imagine them in like they're like the the whole world is like a city to them and then they have apartments houses summer homes cars jobs and they you know they and they're in different parts of different people in different places on different things
Well, I just wanted to get that one out because I thought that was kind of like kind of interesting. The other thing I'm working on is Tron. Um, because talking about God is darkness, it seems like it's pretty important to talk about Tron. And, you know, if you don't know me by now, like my fundamental religious talks are going to be a little, you know. If you don't know me by now, you will never, 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 never know me. This is, if you don't, yeah, this is my principal condition. You know what I mean? But like, okay, so God is darkness, creating creation, uh, the creator creating the creation. In the beginning, Elohim created by forming from nothing the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void of emptiness, um, and a void of emptiness. And darkness was upon the face of the deep primeval seas. The spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good, pleasing, useful, and he affirmed and sustained it. Then God separated the light, distinguishing it from the darkness, right? So he brings forth this thing that is caused, you know, by him saying it straight up, you know? So God says this thing and the sounds uh, in the darkness move across the waters. And in that, like that, that, that vibration, it actually creates, you know, this uh, electric phenomenon of uh, loose, what's it called? Um, has a loose or it's, it's basically electricity and friction that caused the creation of light from sound. So light is Lucifer and God is darkness. And that's the primeval, primordial egg kind of story, you know, that goes, it, it's pretty big in the Abraxas. And so that's something I'll have to talk about more and I'll bring up is like, you know, how gnosis and egyptian gnosis connect like the idea of energy matter like how e equals mc squared really comes from egyptian math and like ancient kabbalistic alchemical traditions which talk about the seven chakras as layers of rays of light within the spectrum that is the being that you're calling the person and the best example for that is the is the perfect being which is the christ because it's like you know the way it ought to be and probably is but you know um, and so Tron the Baptist, that's been the way I've been saying it for years. I feel like I'm the first person. I don't know of anyone else who got that metaphor yet, but like the digital Goetia and the sun of the maker, because they live in a world without the sun. Otherwise, you could call it Metropolis with Frisbees. And I'm sure somebody somewhere said that ever, like Roger Ebert. But yeah, I mean, isn't it obviously like about um metropolis they're the same kind it's a black and white movie that this hand colored it had you know it's in released in the 80s around the same time as Gilgamesh maroder's version and then um in fact i think the same year is Gilgamesh maroder's version to the soundtrack and also uh is is correlated with a sequel that came out the year that the film was finally finished but you have this idea of dusting off the old touchscreen and looking at the high-tech ancient technology and seeing what it really is is like you know on a on a fundamental level like the gnosis principle of fundamentality is the most advanced forms are the most ancient so and there's a lot of shows recently they're kind of like about that like halt and catch fire recently came out which is like you think that the eight spies age of spies ended with the age of the fall no i mean like the beginning of corporate spies is the beginning uh, or it's like the next incarnation of double 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 agents when you have people that have non non-disclosure agreements i mean it's the spy culture the corporate spy culture is far more interesting than the 60s spy culture <laughs> but uh you know and they have pretty even even like to the level of within itself mutiny against themselves and becoming obsessed with their own agendas um and also the important film the c23 or three and 20, not the Jim Carrey one. Please don't even bother with that. But Nichtist Sovais Scheint, I think it's called. You want to say it? It's German. Oh, thanks for assuming my German is. Uh... Nicht, nichts ist so wie es scheint. Nothing is what it seems. Ain't that always the way it is? So this movie is about a German youth who's obsessed with Robert Anton Wilson, which is like, you know, how many of those do we know? Oh man, we should probably mute uh, mute that for a second. Can I unmute her? Uh oh, did I just make it so she can't be unmuted? That's terrible. I didn't mean to do that. Well, I don't know. My bad. She'll be back soon, I'm sure. So okay, so this is a true story about this German kid who was a hacker and how he was disappeared. 
after working for the government or another, I mean, either the East German government or the KGB or some company or some, or the CIA or some middle between, like he got his hands on some of the most powerful mainframes at the time, installed like some sort of a BSD Unix code on them that really put them in overdrive. And all of a sudden he was like being tapped all the time by different government agencies. So like, cause that was the beginning of the hacking infrastructure where you know the five eyes the british government the american government we're all working together to try to find people like this and the german government the west german government was certainly complacent with working with somebody that might have been working with the kgb um so he was disappeared and uh that was pretty sad but before all that there was tron you know like pretty much the first thing and like even if no matter what you believe in i think they kind of got past being um like argued it about because it was you know about electrons and we're pretty sure electrons exist you know we talk about electricity so but like the story goes that deep in the 1980s there was a giant touch tablet that already existed it's like an iphone before they got smaller it's like the first of them the grandpa iphone and it became self-aware and you know through the uh, self-realization of abracadabra and like the one who knows this is the maker um, Flynn. And there are a bunch of people that work together to write parts of this program. So that's why it decides that it's not just made by, by one, which is another interesting thing about like, if you think about the Thothian way of, of Disney, that they would make that another, you know, and, and little things that they put in it to, to be a little irreverent, such as they call the maker, the user, right? Like a user account. So the user is, uh, you know, talking to the programs and one of many not to be revered. But the program enslaves the users and especially the one that it rises from the top through and captures the maker, which is a trip actually. Like the way it scans him down is from the limbs and then his whole spine is the first and then it goes at the eventually through the sacral. Um, but yeah, through the, into the Ark of the Covenant, right? Into the mainframe, into the server, into the monolithic cube, um, through the laser eye and you know into the fiber optic digital reality where he's deresoluted um and and that's what the mcp is planning on doing to deresolute anyone who stands in his way which is like i mean if you didn't see the crucifix metaphor of tron like it's there clearly and the maker foresees this like that it's all the thing about this movie i've found certain people find it boring and they tend to be atheists with not a lot of background in symbology um even the ones who are atheists who are just like you know, like they just are, don't want to think about this kind of level of pathos, perhaps, but it tends to be something that's more interesting to people that have a religious background, even an evil background, right? And I think you kind of almost have to have a satanic or Christian or um, pagan uh, or Masonic or some sort of a, I mean, just to find these inside jokes at all funny, because like there's, there must be really, really humorous inside jokes to the people who write this stuff. But I think for most people, they just aren't that interesting, you know. But here you got this idea that Flynn has created uh, Clue in his own image. And it, he says it very verbatim. You know, he's the maker. And you know, the dude, Jeff Bridges, plays the maker. And Clue is a codified um, likeness utility. So in a sense, he's just following in the idea that he is like Lucifer, he's the, you know, the image made in, in the likeness. Um, but his difference between him and a, a normal human, he has no choice, right? He's just forced to do as he's designed to do. So he's basically a Goisha, he's like a, a demon. He's like, and that's what the Linux term for it is, is a daemon with a, you know, the D-A-E or the key, you know, like the, 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 the middle symbol for that for daemonology it has a lot to do with programs like even the language apple's operating system is written on bsd which is a uh, their symbol is a red demon i should find that put that up i guess but hacking into the grid abracadabra greetings programs um eventually flynn gets into the realm he sees like a sinister realm he can't really like escape false atheist technologarchy runs the you know the planet and they say anyone who believes in the user is destroyed and interesting also to look at the map you'll see pac-man is on his map so pac-man is actually a guard for the system um and the ghosts are you know guards for the system so it 
it's like they, the whole thing is demons that are running this realm, this labyrinth that are keeping them safe, and the superhuman uh, being this kind of upwards thing instead of being this downwards thing. So looking at Tron as this sort of creation that's to replace um, humanity, not the other way around. You know, and that's also another sign of its like lack of of um, fundamentality. It doesn't believe in the gnosis principle that the fundamental is the highest form or the best form. You know, instead it, it tries to produce that there's a Athenian Hellenistic light comes second and then third will be Isis and there's in the age of Aquarius. So that things are getting better all the time, which you know, you do you be the judge for yourself if that's really what's happening. But master control program, um oh Phil's got a video up, check that out. Master control program, which is basically Moses, according to South Park, it is anyway. You know, they've made the point that the master control program is Moses. And um, he's the maker um, of the user's accounts. So he kind of fundamentally is a chess program that uh, was the first to connect with the outside world of uh, leaders, you know, of users, of makers. And in it so much so much irreverence is put into things like do all users have a plan and like all users must have a plan right but no users are revealed to be like other programs and they just make it all up as they go along um and that's actually pointed out in the second film that it's a strength that they improvise not just not a weakness that they don't uh, have plans um but tron baptizes the maker in the energy pools in the middle of the film which i find to be like the most interesting like why is this not more talked about i just don't get why this isn't obvious to people tron the bat it just rhymes maybe i'm missing more too because there's the tape access recorder tar files and ion elohim and you know i'm sure that there's more you could say like the tar god but uh we'll get into that but like tron the baptist i'm just so pushed on by that theory and i just think that yeah there's like some more information there that they do like Put around there to make it obvious like tron is not tron's like a, a gabriel or an archangel like that too because he's trying to protect the maker um but the believers and the users are being hunted down so they have to go to the tar guard right and that's literally the name of the file uh it's not even an, a, an allegory i mean it is but in linux or in unix or in mainframe systems you have tape access records right so you have like the tar files. They're called dot tar. If you're installing anything on Linux, you you have to use dot tar. Let me see if I can find, you know, tar dot hashtag tar, CVF, techmint, 1492 dot 12 tar. This is like a file I found just so I could get an example of what it would look like to access a tape record. And the way tape records work is you have a tape that is just solid and it's a recording of sound and on it are digital records and they're played back, you know? So you've got data that's recorded for later and you can change that with modems. And that's where modems come in because they can replace the tape record with live speech protocol or with the Grossel algorithm can actually do data. But Dumont, which is a name also of a very important company, get into that, like the, the, the oil and rubber trees and their existence in the ancient rubber mills, cutting down the rainforest. That's but Dupont. These, no, Dupont too, but Dumont is a company. Dumont, uh, right. what does Dumont do then? Is that not right? Am, am I missing something? I don't think Dupont, did Dupont do rubber trees? Hmm. Dumont was a television network. Okay. One of the world's pioneer commercial television networks rivaling NBC and CBS. It was owned by Dumont Laboratories. Dumont Laboratories was an American equipment manufacturer in 1931 in New Jersey, uh, founded by Alan Dumont. Alan Dumont was an inventor of cathode ray tubes for use in televisions. Um, okay, yeah, so that's that's even better. So he's a guy who invents the tubes, you know, the series of tubes. This is Al Gore. I'm just kidding. But so this guy invented the real series of tubes, though, that had the bugs in them, not mosquitoes, but. Now I've got now I've got enough puns for the next real live recording. I'm sorry. Hi, How's I just missed going? everything. Oh man, you're gonna like this stuff. I got some stuff on uh, Tron the Baptist, and cool. I'm doing you know a little bit of that. I'm I'm halfway through it. I'm just gonna do. I'll okay. just say the last little bit I was at, which is like they meet the Targard, 
And the tar guard is the way that you can connect with the outside world. And it's based on Dumont and Dumont. We were just realizing was the inventor of the cathode ray tube and had his own television station that was shut down. Uh, CBS and NBC and Dumont were like contemporaries and, du and Dumont was shut down. But Dumont is the tar guard Tartarian. And they even say it in the show that they have to go to the tar guard, but tar is important to Linux and Unix and mainframes because you use a tape access record to um, play back data that's recorded in sound magnetically. And this would be what it would look like in a computer system. You'd be like home slash tar, CVF, TechMint, run tar sequence, and it would like play the tar at a certain speed off the tape. And then eventually there were modems and you could record information live and communicate with the system directly. And that would be like an internetwork um, of live systems. So okay. that that's like why the Technosphinx Oracle in Tron is called the Targard. And it, eventually he's martyred for the users by his choice to refuse to, um, you know, submit to the MCP. And he's deresoluted in order that they can keep all systems out. And even the character Ram, you know, which is his name you could compare to like, you know, the go to the Ram, but also to the random access memory. He becomes disintegrated, deresoluted into, you know, the kind of, Gnostic, uh, druidic idea of everyone becomes part of the mainframe again. But all of them are sort of martyrs, and it makes it possible for Tron the Baptist to connect to the outside and actually get to the word the maker. And the maker is not the MCP, which we were mentioning, you know, there's like the master control program, and he's basically Moses because in South Park compares him to Moses because he was the first to actually get access to the outside world. And is made most in the image of the user, which you know is another little Disney dystopian pun because they call the maker the user, but it's also correct in terms of how the Linux systems work that you know programs are talked to through and by users, but also coders, right? So coder should be the correct term. Hacker could be another term, but coder has something to do with being a tapestry weaver, and that you know that's like what the wife and the Iliad is doing is she's coding. Um, so there's a whole thing that's Tron's all about the digital Goetia. It's all about summoning spirits, uh, which are the daemons. And daemons are the Linux name for programs, right? So you would say like, if you're using Apple or you're using Windows, the kernel, like the kernel, if it's the BSD Unix kernel, it's using a series of daemons to run a system. And that's literally the, the techno jargon that they use. They call them daemons, all the programs, the sub programs. But what's interesting about Tron 2 is that it jumps from the story of the maker to the son of the maker. And instead of it being about the sacrifice of the son, it's the sacrifice of the father because it's bringing forth the age of Aquarius. Um, and in the age of Aquarius, there's this goddess, you know. So let me see if I can get to that part. <laughs> I've just started going through this a bit, so. But Flynn has become the most powerful maker, the son of the maker, saved by Tron the Baptist. Oh, I'll go back just for it. Okay, I like Metropolis. This is why this matters. In 2010, because 1982 is when Metropolis Yogi Maroder version came out. It was also the year that Tron came out. Um, Metropolis 2010 was also the year that Metropolis, the full film, all the deleted scenes and, and hidden scenes were found, right? Well, that's also the year that they produced um, uh, Tron Legacy. And Tron Legacy is like Metropolis with Frisbees. And I don't think Roger Ebert actually said that, but it sounds like something he would. So I'm going to use that. Plus Daft Punk and Daft Punk was pretty, pretty cool. And they did the whole soundtrack. And I don't mean just like DJ it. They were also writing like a symphony score, which was, you know, like pretty great. But Flynn becomes the most powerful maker. The son of the maker uh, who has no contact with him comes into the realm, which by the way is a dark realm. The disc has the light. Notice that, that the realm is completely in darkness, the whole movie. And they've got neons to kind of like, you know, electronic uh, neon lights, you know, more than there's even LEDs. And 2010 also, it's like the year of the second 2001 A Space Odyssey, the final Odyssey. But in, in this, uh, both films, they talk about the importance of like resurrection and the Phoenix and creating a new thing. And it's also very much about ISIS. So you've got this character called the ISO, which is like a disc image you know, image uh, scanned object or something like that. I need to make that go away. Very annoying message. Okay. Um, and so ISO is, she's ISO, Cora, 
a kora is also the image of the instrument that the guitar is based on the african instrument and you have to think it's it's the maker's favorite program right so what's the devil's favorite thing is music and what's the devil's favorite instrument probably the guitar right and what's well but really maybe the kora because it's the first you know maybe it's like kind of similar you know, it, it, it really comes down to that fundamentality. And also interesting is what they're eating at their table is a pig. And of all, this is the only meal they eat in the whole movie is they eat a pig, you know? So that replaces the first movie where they baptize, you know, but all the while Clue, which was made in the image of Flynn, the maker, um, is planning an invasion to our realm, you know, because he thinks that that's the best way of taking the resources uh, that he, and, you know, this is what he was programmed to do. Sympathy for the devil for a second. Like this, you put yourself in the shoes of Lucifer. He's created in the image of God, but he's not God. And he's told to do what he's told to do, which is to make the perfect system. And every day he does that. And then God says, actually, I don't really want the perfect system. I want to network with other systems and, you know, have this organic experience and allow this, uh, you know, these images to just sort of self-generate and digital jazz. And yeah, that's not what, you know, that's how God has changed by reflection of looking at what perfect system has been created. So that's an interesting aspect to this movie. I never really went into it expecting, um, you know, you watch a Disney movie, you know, it's going to be evil, but you, you, it's funny, like how, how passionate they can be about the devil. So then, you know, the Tron 316 moment goes down, except it's backwards because in this version, the maker sacrifices himself to bring forth the ISO into the world and brings this goddess um, into the world by destroying himself and Clue, the image, because he has to destroy his own disc, which destroys his identity and he dies. But also at the same time, it destroys Clue. So there's this dualism trip that's destroying each other. And in the end, you've got the son who's not perfect, but he's basically perfect. And the father sacrifices himself for the daughter or whatever he would call his favorite. And she's, you know, again, Isis, the ISO. And he believes it's important because she's going to fabricate DNA technology that'll heal humanity and it'll transform the world of humanity, I think is literally the words that they use. Um, and so it ends with right before they leave this matrix, they're talking about what's it like out there? What, you know, because they might not make it. And they're thinking, well, it's warm because of the sun. And they talk, oh yeah, there's no sun here. It's the first time you kind of think about that in the movie, the whole movie you've been in darkness and everything's been very moody and they're self illuminated beings, but outside, you know, mm -hmm there's light so they live on this they live in this disc you know is what they say and it's it's kind of like the realm of saturn right they're in the disc and they're they end it with being like let's tie together what's our commonality well we all love the sun it's it's warm and without it we would not have anything which is this whole maker trip right that there's the maker and the sun and the light it's all tied together and the maker being the devil and are you living in the devil's realm and is it good? <laughs> but she decides she wants to see the sun. And he says, I want to show you the sun. And I think it's like, the point of it is that God is darkness. So that's kind of my, that's my trip. Hmm. Wow. Holy. That's deep. <laughs> There's another half of that I already did. So when this is done, you can hear that. <laughs> We probably won't put this yeah, up well, no, I, I want to like I was actually better. just talking about that to a friend that was here because you had mentioned you were going to talk about what you just did. And I said, it'll be interesting to hear um, Andreas' take on God is darkness. So I heard part of it. Yeah, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I covered enough of like, uh, so, I, you know, if there's more things I need to say, like I, the beginning of it, like I said, I talked about how God moves upon the waters. Um, mm -hmm. Where's that? In the, you know, and I use the amplified version of the Bible, which I kind of like. It's basically the King James, but it's written by some Bible college scholars. So they they have like brackets usually around places or parentheses, and they'll be like, "This is you know," and then cited. This is the word we use, and here are some other translations for it. But it's not too dense, so you can get through it. But it's like in the beginning, Elohim created by forming 
from nothing the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void of empty and void and, and a void of emptiness, and darkness was upon the face of the deep primeval seas. The Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So in in a it's sense, not the light. So, yeah. It kind of poet points out, even he says, I affirmed it, I sustained it, I saw it as good, and I separated the light, you know, so it's separated. So it's like it is in a sense, God's like, all right, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to be that. Let that. I mean, I own it, but I'm not going to be it. <laughs> That's really cool. Darkness he called night. So you're saying he's not the light, but he is. Is that, cool. would that okay? Be so yeah, that? And then there's that, that's a good point too. So I did at some point I talked about that. So the idea is he's not dark. He's not the dark. He's not, but he's yeah. the dark. But God is the darkness. It's the place from which um, everything comes from. And so really, you could, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's right to say God is any one part of it, right? That would be silly. But the dark, mm -hmm. it's out of it's out of the darkness where things come from. And from within the darkness, there's the voice. Really, because God's voice said, you know, God said, let there be light. So when his voice moved upon the waters, then light came out of that. That's like a physical reaction from the mm -hmm. friction upon the seas. But I don't know if you'd say that that's that God's the voice, because even then the seraphim is the angel of the voice. So it could be that there's a number of, of evolving angels <laughs> or like creations like that existed up until Lucifer. You know, because the beginning also, like, what is that? How long is that? You know, even in Genesis, it references things like Enoch, which we, you know, we know Enoch is not um, in the Bible proper, but parts of it are. So, you know, we might, you could say, because it's not in the Bible, if you're somebody who's like that, you could say, okay, well, it's not fully truth, but at least, you know, if some of it's in the Bible, parts of it are fully truth you know so it's worth looking into at least and it's a pretty decent uh series of stories about the creation and the angels and the different um angels that existed at the beginning but that's why i thought tron was so good at telling that story because it's probably told by people who really get the inside joke like pretty strongly you know i mean like they might be on the wrong side of things which is why i'm trying i don't know like that's fair to say anyone's on you know it's not good to judge side. but it's good to, it's good to say that there was a side drawn at one point and that's like kind of the idea is that moses draws the line so it's interesting that moses is the line in south park you know because if the mcp is moses then we're we are talking about a line that's crossed and if you're not supposed to cross that line, I mean, but all, all at the end of it, you know, you have still an interesting story because it gives you a deep look into the psyche and pathology and philosophy of sun worshipers and of Crowleyans, you know, like, and, and of, you know, of that time, especially, but it's even of a time today because Disney more than ever seems like they're doing this with their time they're aiming towards the next uh, the next version of this, the next incarnation of this story. And it, it always seems to be, you know, in the same vein where it, it's questioning the biblical narrative almost sarcastically. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have a question about that because there's been so much just different people saying their opinion on what should and shouldn't be in the Bible. And so you're sharing things here that, there's things to be taken, you know, literal in a sense and pieces that were included mean that it was true. What are your thoughts then about the Bible being, um, I don't know, tampered with over time and getting back to the most authentic version of the Bible that we can find? I mean, have you? Well, so I don't know if getting back to something is ever the right answer always. Because okay. sometimes it's worth, it, sometimes it's worth seeing what what or where we're going but at the same time the originals are a collection of things you know so pope gregory in croatia at one point said look we have all these ideas why don't we put some down i like these ones and we kind of just went with that forever you know and there's the there's uh i think the talk i'm going to do soon i'm going to put out probably like tomorrow with phil lawler he talks a lot about this and his theory um that the universe uh the, the that the universe is stories creating stories like the most fundamental force 
is God's use of storytelling. So even saying, let there be light is telling a story that comes out and that story allows for, you know, the creation of, you know, a universal realm. It's the abracadabra, right? So yeah. w without, without there being like a certain amount of storytelling to begin with, we wouldn't exist. And we are stories, you know, you've got your whole life, your whole day is a story. So without, without even, without even going too far out of, out of what you are, it's like, if you're in the image of God and your life is a series of stories, then stories are a very big part of what God is and what the creation is, you know, in the process of the creation, you know, like, and it's, it's like a struggle, it's pathos. It's what goes up and comes down. It's like the stories, like the, the range of the character is based on, on that. So maybe it's not supposed to like be that we, um, that we worry so hard it's like if we find something that we resonate with then we should analyze it to its like to its end place you know and if there if there's parts of it that we don't then we should figure out why that is you know it's not it's like i've i watch tv shows i don't like you know i think a lot of people argue that they should i mean you know i don't do it all the time but I know some people will say like, oh, why should I invest my energy into something like, well, man, if you're that worried that it's going to influence you, then maybe it will. You know, maybe there is something really valuable to or powerful to it if it's able to do that. And, you know, again, if you can watch TV shows and say, okay, well, they're not that great. They're just dumb shows. I mean, you're wait, you know, that's that kind of vegetative imprinting. Shouldn't you be more concerned with that than like reading different versions of the Bible? But I do know some people that like translating the Bible, you know, cause there's ways of doing it that are like, you learn Greek, you learn Aramaic, you learn Russian, you know, like look at the old words and you come up with new ways of reading those words. And I believe that they're, you know, like that that's kind of the Warner brothers cartoon like approach to the Bible or to God's storytelling, which is like, there are layers to it that you don't get until you get older. And by the time you get to be really old, you're like, wow, no kid would ever get that. That was a really dark thing that they did in that cartoon, but no kid's ever going to get that. So it's only for those who reach 55 or something. So, I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that's worth, you know, going through and like questioning if it's like completely, if you're asking if it's metaphorical, but um, you know, if you, you can start by assuming everything's metaphor and then it's just like when it gets intense is where you realize a lot of it's not, a lot of it's, or a lot of it's much more than metaphor. A lot more of it's, a lot more of it's real, you know, than anything else. And that, I think that's what kind of uh, bothers people the most isn't like, you know, what if it's not true? Mm -hmm. It's, <laughs> so they're more concerned with the plausibility of it being true, you know? And that's, yeah, I think that'll be, an interesting conversation that we have too. Cool. Well, thank you for that tidbit of information. All right. Do you want to do some stuff on volcanoes? I think that, that was what we really got here for originally. My bad. No. <laughs> I, Hi. I'm just, I'm just showing a video on uh, daylight. Oh, I, I, think, I think this guy did great work. He uh, he basically goes about and shows the he, he offers the solution to Andreas's blue question. Using electromagnetism and catheter tubes and test the coil. That's the only way to answer my questions. I appreciate him. I can't help it. My oh system my is only 720 pixels. Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Join us on another exciting adventure of Exertus. This program is coming to you via Relay 2 Satellite a spacecraft orbiting the Earth at a speed of over 17,000 miles per hour. Exertus. <laughs>